right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, raise your hands if you uh, got the cultural clue in the music. A minority. Um, so it's the less recognizable part of well, I don't know what the actual name of the piece is, but the start of Dr. Strangelove. Thank you very much for teeing it up. Thanks for coming, everyone. So at this thinking uh, about Britain's nuclear deterrent, we're going to try and work out if it's big enough, if it's new enough, if it makes the world safer or more dangerous, and whether we need, need it at all. I feel I should start with a, a brief confession, which is that in a previous job, I used to sit in meetings and with all the conviction of a journalist with half a day's reading, um, would argue that there were no conceivable circumstances. This is in the back end of the last decade in which an independent British nuclear deterrent could possibly be, be necessary. In other words, circumstances in which um, the UK's ultimate security wouldn't be guaranteed by having a bit of space under an American nuclear umbrella. And the confession part is that uh, I'm not quite so sure anymore. What's changed? A couple of things. Trump. Uh, this is just a personal view that he represents a somewhat unpredictable form of US leadership. And of course, the world's biggest nuclear power, as we saw from one of the slides, is now waging war in the heart of Europe and making pretty thinly veiled reminders that uh, it has nuclear weapons uh, at its disposal. I forget one of the phrases that P Putin has used is weapons that you can't even imagine. But he enjoys uh, having surrogates go out and remind us about his tactical, i.e. relatively small nuclear weapons, uh, and about his hypersonic missiles on which perhaps or perhaps not he can, um, he can mount warheads. Um, Maybe those things don't change the, the larger calculus. Maybe they do. I hope that, that we can find out. I'm delighted that we're joined by some uh, veterans in the best sense of the argument from, from both sides, possibly, of the argument, but perhaps with, with more in common than they realize. Again, that's something we, we might find out. They are uh, Dr. Andrew Corbett, who joins us from Scotland online. Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Dr. Hassan El Batimi, and I will say a little bit more about you when we when we come to you. But first, um, I just wanted to echo what Mark was saying in his excellent warm-up act, which is a, an innovation for thinkings, which is this is really as much about what you all think and want to say as what our guest speakers want to say. We find that if everybody speaks up and does so at the early on rather than leaving it to the last few minutes we all benefit. So your views as well as questions, if you've any experience of protesting or taking one side of this argument or the other, please raise your hand uh, digitally and I hope I will see you in the chat. Or, or, or no, I will see you in the chat if you chat in the chat. Um, uh, if you raise your hand digitally, then I hope my colleagues will draw your att my attention to you. And if you're in the room, please do it in the old-fashioned way. Right. Um, without more ado, let me come to Dr. Hassan Elbatimi, Director of the Centre for Scientific and Security Studies at King's College London, but perhaps even more importantly, editor of what I'm going to call a Bible of uh, nuclear arms control, the NPT briefing book, the non-proliferation treat treaty briefing book, which I took a look at. It's a heck of a read. Um, <laughs> um, can you start by giving us a, a little bit of an overview? As, as I understand it, the context for this discussion should be that there was substantial nuclear disarmament after the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, full-throated uh, expression around 2007 on the US side of the desire for a nuclear-free uh, world, echoed by Obama in 2009. But since then, um, precious little meaningful disarmament. So my first question is why? And then I have a follow-up, which is more about the UK and now. Well, that's, um, that's a big question. I, 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 yeah. I wonder whether what is the real starting point for this? Because 
um, the idea of the song will actually um, and meaningful, deep control of nuclear weapons started almost at the same time they were conceived. So they go back a very, very, very long way. Um, it's basically the scientists that took part in developing the first nuclear weapons production project, the Manhattan Project in the US, that were the first to start to think like, what have we created? We need to do something about it. We should not leave this with politicians. Um, uh, very early on, the very first resolution that the United Nations developed was on control of nuclear weapons. So, something that you know, not um, a lot of people remember. Um, the United Nations very early on was very, very concerned with how to control nuclear weapons. Even now thinking about schemes that are pretty much not very much discussed, like international control of nuclear weapons. The nuclear, con nuclear weapons are not going to be in the control of any one country, but in a, deposited with an international organization that can actually um, have full control over it because we don't trust it with states. States will end up using it against one another. What we need is something that reflects humanity to have control of such a weapon with disastrous uh, consequences. Um, but the sad thing is that these ideas, and going back to your 2007 point and much later actually as well, um, that these ideas never really materialized. And what we, um, the situation that we find ourselves in um, is one where nuclear weapons are very much entrenched into our lives, into our thinking, into whether it's a nuclear weapon state or a non-nuclear weapon state, it's part of the landscape we grew, grow up in, uh, part of the architecture that forms um, international security. And despite all these different efforts to try to control it, um, uh, we, we are still on that journey. I'm one of the, uh, of the people engaged in this that I want to see us accelerate further down that journey and get to the point where nuclear weapons are not really part of our, our lives. That's because I think the risk of nuclear weapons is much more uh, pronounced than any benefits. And there are a lot of people that say that there are benefits and maybe this is something that we can get to in the discussion. Um, but the fact is, is that we are where we are and we are uh, at a point of time where there are nine nuclear weapon states. So that is nine countries around the world that have independent nuclear arsenals, that governments of these countries have the capacity, will with them, and if they want the political will to deploy and use such weapons, um, and also have far too many nuclear weapons. Um, although there is a significant asymmetry um, in terms of numbers. Right. So within these nine, there are two that are quite significantly apart from the rest and that is the United States and Russia. Almost 90% of nuclear weapons stockpiles are with the US and Russia, um, and far less with the rest of the uh, countries. Why have we not managed to disarm? Um, that's actually a very difficult question. Um, I think um, nuclear weapons managed to entrench themselves in our thinking, in the thinking of elites in a lot of different countries and the thinking of the militaries in a lot of different countries. And they have also acquired kind of like a symbolism, perhaps one that we can or need to question uh, related to status. Right. Um, that for example, in order to be a big and great power, you need to have nuclear weapons. Um, that it is part of the paraphernalia of being a great power. Um, uh, and, and I think that plays a role uh, in, in terms of um, forestalling our journey towards meaningful and deep reductions. Um, we have bureaucracies that over the years developed around nuclear weapons in terms of design, manufacturing, and so on. And these are political constituencies as well that can throw around their weight. Um, in other words, we got used to it. Right. Um, and, and part of the journey of understanding how to decrease their salience towards abolition is to try to untangle that dynamic of we got used to them.
and try to reverse that. But it's hard, isn't it, to make a case for spending tens or, by some estimates, even hundreds of billions uh, on an, uh, uh, when the argument is based on nebulous things like status and symbolism. Um, I mean, let me just read a line, if I can find it in my notes, from the Integrated Review, which was the last sort of landmark UK government document um, to set out uh, a consensus, well, a government consensus view on the appropriate size of the UK's arsenal, much smaller than, than those big ones on the bar chart. Um, so they um, said uh, warhead numbers, uh, which were in the process when the review was published, what, 2019, of being brought down from 225 to 180 warheads, but would have to go up to 260, quote, in recognition of the evolving security threat environment, uh, sorry, in recognition of the evolving security threat environment, this, that is, the lower target of 180, is no longer possible. And, and um, the UK would need 260 warheads for some reason. Why? What on earth um, can be deterred with 260 that, that can't be deterred with 180? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. I don't have an answer to this, and, I, and the answer to this is actually not even also public, which is one of the things that well, needs there's, there's a, to be highlighted. A, a large, unredacted uh, part of that document? Mm, no, so I think the, so maybe the discussions behind it, I mean, it's not mentioned in the document. It's a 100 pages document. It was released or made public in, after a year of drafting and consultation and made public in March 2021, I believe. Um, um, uh, yes, it talks about an uncertain future, and the future can be uncertain, but I wonder to what degree are we locked into that um, uh, un uncertainty. Um, I think um, the, uh, the, the language of, about uncertainty has, has, has been around for a long period of time, but the difference that you that we're talking about in terms of the cap and growing that cap higher, I think you're spot on on asking the question: What would a 260 deter and and 240 not uh, not deter? Uh, but I would question your skepticism about symbolism. I think symbolism is really key, and I think it's very difficult to understand this report without actually understanding that it came at a very specific moment, the moment where. This country is trying to reposition itself globally, uh, perhaps refashioning its position after Brexit, uh, perhaps look more assertive, perhaps um, use different tools and, pro and project an image. Um, and even the hardcore um, believers in nuclear deterrence realize that credibility uh, is a key part of it. And that boils down into what others think that you're ready to do. Right. So I would not discount symbolism, really. Right. Well, look, uh, I, let me come to you, uh, Rebecca Johnson. Um, I said I'd say a little bit more about you. You uh, were at Greenham Common for f five years, at least five years between 81 and 87. Uh, for those of you too young to remember, Greenham Common was the great uh, uh, anti-nuclear protest, a permanent presence around the barbed wire fence of the... Yes. Of the cruise missile. Of the cruise missile base. base. Yes. yes. Um, but you've since been intimately involved in negotiating nuclear arms reduction treaties. You are now executive director of the Acronym Institute, which, for disarmament diplomacy, which, as the name suggests, is a catch all for many uh, previous groups with, with, ac with acronyms. Um, but I'm going to unfairly bring you to now, even though you have such long experience. Um, presumably, your answer to the question, does the UK have enough nukes, is it has way too many and the optimum number is zero. But given not Brexit, but the war, given this evolving threat scenario that the Integrated Review talks about, is, is no nukes really enough in the circumstances? Well... <clears throat> There's a lot kind of wrapped up in that question. When I was invited and I was told that the, the title was going to be, you know, does the UK have enough? Immediately came into my mind, well, enough to do what? 
because if we're thinking about you know enough to destroy the earth many many times actually the current number 180 is enough to destroy the planet so imagine what it's like with around 13,000 in the hands of nine countries uh, uh, scientists climate scientists uh, from the United States, combined with the Scientists for Global Responsibility based here in the UK, and also doctors and phys physicians that look at impacts um, overall when nuclear weapons are used, actually calculated, and, 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 and we published this, that if the nuclear fire firepower on just one submarine armed with the Trident missiles uh, they carry an average these days, or they have been prior to the 2021 integrated review. We're not sure now how that's going to change. When they talk about more numbers, are they now going to be talking about you know, new types? We know new types are being developed at Aldermaston. But if we think of the average of 40 uh, UK uh, nuclear warheads atop uh, eight, um, Trident missiles on yeah, one, uh, about 40 per submarine, so about five or, you know, it's, th those numbers have changed, though, the, you know, the Vanguard Tridents were designed for a lot more, and, uh, and then, of course, with the INF Treaty, we started to roll back the US. Soviet weapons, the Cold War ended, and suddenly there was a kind of race to get rid of at least uh, the more tactical theater type, uh, at that time thought to be the, essentially the nuclear war fighting weapons. Yeah. So there were years and years and years, I mean, over 30 years, in which Trident, you know, the number of, uh, and the explosive power on the nuclear weapons has been played around with. And so when it's how much is enough, it's, it keeps changing. And this particular government, for I think the reasons that, um, Hassan has very um, helpfully kind of pointed out for our own domestic political purposes about signaling a different role for the UK has decided that we need to look as if we've got more. But in terms of how we use them, just the 40 on one submarine, if targeted at, for the sake of example, this was the baseline study done uh, just three or four years ago, uh, at six um, Russian cities, major cities, including Moscow, that itself f would not just completely pul pulverize those major cities, but it would also create a climate effect through the dust. Mm -hmm. Think loads and loads of, of volcanoes, you know, spewing dust up. If you remember what happened when just that quite small Icelandic volcano put dust in the air and nobody could, could, could fly for a while. Just imagine that multiplied many, many times, and then the dust the dust clouds, they're not only radioactive, so some of that comes down quite far from the area that has been destroyed. Uh, and so that agriculture gets poisoned through radioactivity. But the dust cloud circles around the upper atmosphere, block, blocks the sunlight, changes the climate with abrupt freezing. And this isn't an answer to global heating, by the way, because this is very, very abrupt. If you think of the, the massive problems that we're having with agriculture and with species destruction from the very gradual, you know, global heating that's been happening to our climate, it's, you know, massive storms, it's, it's weather disruptions, it's not we turn into south of France. This isn't, oh, well, well, then we'll turn into Alaska. This is a massive kind of shock to the entire climate system. And the predictions are that that would result in agriculture failing all around the, the, the world. So Africa, which is a completely nuclear-free zone, the whole continent, after South Africa was finally persuaded to get rid of its nuclear weapons, partly due to the politics of, 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 of ending apartheid, they, they made their entire continent into a nuclear weapon-free zone, but they would starve because a lot of those people, or a lot of people already have food insecurity. We've got it increasingly yeah. in this country. So when agriculture is collapsing, people start to starve. 
not just in their millions, but estimates of two billions, basically over a quarter of the world's population within a, a few years of a nuclear armed strike against just six major cities by the warheads traveling on one Trident submarine. Now, that's a scientist's calculations. Now we have to come, so, so yes, we've got more than enough to do that. But it's just on one submarine, and of course we have, and they're planning to get another four submarines, which they've rather curiously called Dreadnought, which seems to equate with, you know, the massive Dreadnought <laughs> ships that turned out to be state-of-the-art, absolute power projection, only it wasn't the weapons that the First World War was fought with. So they were useless. And so, but the trouble is that a lot of resources go into that and then you're not looking at what the resources that you need for, for dealing with today's conflicts, both state-sponsored and non-state-sponsored. And here we come right up to the present because we have Putin, President Putin, who was not deterred at all by the fact that the, the NATO in, in its combined forces has 5,000 nuclear weapons able to be a, a, what we call operational, essentially, uh, well, of, of, of which at least 900 were on sufficiently high alert as to be fairly immediately operational. Putin also, Russia has about the same, actually 5,900 or so, but also, as we understand, looking at, you know, at it, about 900 or so on a high state of what's known as prompt launch alert. And yet, neither side's deterred from playing some fairly dangerous sort of political games. Putin then ups the ante and invades a sovereign state on his borders, Ukraine, uh, and uh, starts pulverizing its cities with what are known as conventional weapons, but let's stop and realize what these weapons are. Things like cruise missiles that they've been, you know, and, and cluster munitions, not nuclear, but causing absolutely appalling devastation to civilian life, which is, was mostly, you know, what, what we were seeing being destroyed in the, you know, by those, those um, missiles and, uh, and so on. That uh, these are state-of-the-art high explosives that don't come anywhere near what nuclear weapons can do, and yet we are seeing daily on our TVs just how much destruction they can cause. Putin was not deterred. Can I just, sorry to interrupt, ask you a question specifically about that. We're going to come to Andrew Corbett in a second, who has commanded two nuclear submarines. But, um, and I know you've got your hand up, and, and we will come to you. Um, but uh, on, on deterrence, a slightly more technical question about that. Um, the possibility of preemptive use is built into Russian nuclear doctrine in a way that it is not in NATO nu nuclear doctrine. Is it possible, should we at least allow the possibility of the argument that if A, the, nu the, the NATO arsenal included more tactical weapons, but sort of a mirror image of those that Russia apparently can deploy, and B, if the doctrine was perhaps at least more ominously um, ambiguous about whether or not they might be used uh, as a war fighting rather than a deterrence measure. Might that have deterred him? Because I absolutely take your point that he has not been deterred. The, the fact is that the broad range of weapon systems that we have were, some were described as strategic, and what that really meant was they were long range, as in US firing at, at, at the Soviet Union and, and or Russia. And tactical was a term used really for short range, often but not always smaller. They were conceived as war fighting is one of the reasons why I went to Greenham Common at the, you know, in, in the 90, early 1980s, well, throughout the 1980s, to actually get that treaty that got rid of the cruise and the Pershing, which was sort of intermediate between the very short range battlefield kind of weapons that 
you know, the UK and the US were deploying in, Euro in, in East Europe and Russia, or the Soviet Union rather was deploying, sorry, in, we, we, we were deploying in West Europe and they were deploying in East Europe. But the, a lot of those weapons did get taken away. They were at the end of the Cold War, and rightly so, because they were, they, they were battlefield, they were, you know, and uh, short range, and they were for fu war fighting. This is why we went to Greenham, because a new generation that were intermediate range were being brought in in the early 1980s with the view to that was, was held by particularly the United States and NATO, but somewhat um, uh, by certain Russian calculations of a limited nuclear war being fought in Europe which would not have felt you at all limited if you lived in, in Europe. And I can see at least some people here would have remembered the, the protect and survive kind of where, where the government actually literally was having to tell us what to do and how many minutes we warning we would get. So this, this notion of, uh, you know, the, the weapons, the fact is that on both sides there are what are still sometimes called strategic and tactical or strategic and non-strategic, but this is about distance and size. They all go bang massively. Yeah. They escalate beyond, and, and you know, and, and, and military leaders will actually say, I can remember sitting in a, a meeting in, in, in Whitehall a few years ago where it was actually somebody from Aldermaston and then uh, you know, and and a, a, a nuclear, I think it was a captain of one of the of the uh, Trident submarines, one of the um, Vanguard submarines, nodding vigorously as this as this 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 guy from Aldermaston basically said, "Look, there's no such thing as non-strategic uses of nuclear weapons. Any use of nuclear weapons absolutely changes the strategic situation and can escalate into." all-out nuclear war through miscalculation, but also that philosophy of use them or lose them that has grown with nuclear weapons in all those sort of, you know, decades since the first nuclear weapons were used. Oh, I've got to cut you off there because time is racing on. We're nearly at the halfway point. We still haven't got to... Um, uh, Dr. Andrew Corbett, a former commander of two Trident submarines and author of Supreme Emergency, How Britain Lives with the Bomb. Thank you for your patience. I hope we can find you there in Edinburgh. Um, Andrew, or Andy, as I'm told, I may refer to you. Um, <laughs> just give us your take on um, the changing threat scenario, to use the jargon of the uh, um, integrated review, and what the appropriate military response is and, and where nuclear weapons should fit into it. Okay, thanks. Um, firstly, and perhaps against, um, against stereotypes, there's a number of things I'd like to agree with. Um, firstly, I think the, uh, the, the, the increase in the stockpile number to, to 260, actually in, in terms of um, deterrence itself, um, makes very little difference. The, the important number as Rebecca indicated, is that the number that's actually deployed on the submarines, because one of those submarines is constantly at sea, and the British strategy is one of assured response. So anybody who attacks the UK or its vital interests is pretty much guaranteed that there is something out there that could respond, uh, and that relies on the stealth of the submarines and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and what also came out in the integrated review was that the UK will now no longer publish that limit. So Rebecca, again, was quite right. It, it used to be uh, an, uh, a limit of 40 per submarine, and now we don't know what it is. Um, whether it's more or not, I, I, I really couldn't say. There might be a rationale for increasing the stockpile number, which is as the warheads are updated, they're, they're, just being, they're, not, they're not being updated in the sense of additional capabilities being added. They're just being modernized because they're quite old. Um, it may be that more are needed to, in order to cycle them through as they, uh, the older ones are taken out. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the impact of um, the war in Ukraine, I think I disagree vehemently. What we're seeing with, with Ukraine is nuclear deterrence in action two ways. Ukraine is not a nuclear power and is experiencing conventional devastation on a level that Europe hasn't really seen since 1945. 
And I think one of the things that we forget significantly at our peril is that the, the absence of major wars, and I mean major wars between the larger powers in the world uh, since 1945 is perfectly so far, and I always accept the so far, <clears throat> perfectly coincident with the advent of nuclear weapons. These things are ludicrously scary. But it is the fear of the use of a nuclear weapon, I would contend, that has reduced the, the willingness of states to use even conventional forces against other nuclear states. So to a very great extent, what we're seeing in Ukraine with the West's hesitation to, uh, to supply if you like more modern conventional weapons or, or direct intervention, it's as a result of the fact that Russia is a nuclear power. Similarly, what we're seeing in the, uh, the, 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 the way that Russia is limiting the, um, its aggression to Ukraine is the fact that it recognizes that NATO is also a nuclear power. And so what we're seeing is, uh, if you like, a cap on top of albeit if you're in Ukraine, a fairly horrendous situation, but it's not getting worse. Uh, and to be honest, I would defy anybody to argue that if, if nuclear weapons didn't exist, that NATO would not have intervened to prevent the humanitarian crisis that Putin has, um, has caused. Um, I'll pick you up on, on a point. It's yeah, an sure. interesting, interesting point that you made there about essentially Russian restraint. Are you pointing to the fact that he has not um, either used his own tactical nuclear weapons or gone after Ukrainian infrastructure more aggressively? No, I'm, I'm not saying that he's, um, he's exercised restraint against Ukraine at all. Um, <clears throat> I don't think he has. I, I know, it doesn't look like it. The New York Times had an interesting piece just last week about why he might not have been even more aggressive. That's all I thought you were referring to. Well, potentially, um, but, but I think what was, you know, he, he hasn't, uh, he has made veiled nuclear threats, um, uh, as, you, as you said in your introduction. Uh, and he did much the same in, uh, in 2014 during the, inv the, uh, the invasion and occupation of Crimea. In fact, it was even more pronounced in 2014. Um, but what he hasn't done is, 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 is take any sort of greater actions against the West or NATO or, or, or really, um, yeah, uh, any other further actions against any of the, uh, the, the, the states that, that, if you like, uh, occupy that, that, that NATO nuclear umbrella. Um, one, one further point I'd, I'd, uh, I'd say is that NATO has been very clear since, since 1991 that any use of a, a nuclear weapon would fundamentally change the nature of any conflict. And um, as, as, as Patricia, uh, Rebecca said, sorry, um, in the, the early 1980s, NATO and uh, the, the Soviet Union both had deterrent strategies that relied on this notion. So I think most anybody with any common sense would, would agree that it's nonsense, that you could fight and win a nuclear war. And those of us who remember the, uh, the, the, the the day after tomorrow, or the various disaster movies that came out in the early 1980s, would remember that, that idea just being ludicrous. Um, but the very notion of deterrence has changed. And, and as I say, I think perhaps the, uh, the most strident example of that is NATO's 1991 um, uh, strategic policy, which, 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 which clearly stated that, that the use of nuclear weapons would fundamentally change any conflict. So, so the idea of we're using the same words as we had in the 1980s, but they mean something completely different. And similarly, they, uh, I, I must admit, I haven't read the, uh, the, 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 sort of the, the link between environmental disaster and nuclear weapons uh, that, that was referred to, but the vast majority of nuclear weapons now are what are called airbursts. So the idea is, if you look at the, uh, the, the damage that was caused to, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those were called ground burst weapons. They are, they are, the blast hit the ground uh, and the, the fireball hit the ground and scooped up all this dust into the atmosphere. The definition 
difference between a ground burst and an air burst is that the fireball doesn't hit the ground. So you still get that massive blast damage, but it knocks stuff over. It doesn't lift up the, uh, the, the debris into the atmosphere. So I'm not quite sure, again, if we're going back to this, whether modern studies are using old means or old technology or understanding of technology uh, in order to, to portray their picture. Um, but my understanding, and certainly of the, of the Western weapons, is that they're generally airburst weapons. And the idea is that they can do the destruction without the, the environmental damage. Uh, Andy, uh, in a minute, we're going to have a brief pause when people joining us online are going to be invited to vote in a poll answering the question. But briefly, very quickly, I want to be clear about one thing, which is that are you saying you reject the notion that Putin has not been deterred in this war? You're saying to an extent he has been. Am I right about that? Right. Um, yes, but... You know, he hasn't been deterred from invading Ukraine, clearly. Ukraine's not a nuclear weapons state. It never was, despite any of these, you know, people might say, well, they gave them up in 94. They didn't. But they, um, Ukraine is not a nuclear weapons state. NATO has a nuclear weapons, or has a deterrence policy that includes nuclear weapons and many other aspects to it. Um, and in combination, those deterrence, uh, that deterrence strategy is working to the extent that this conflict is not spreading. We do indeed. Um, so 82% uh, of people online said, yes, we have enough. 3% um, said, no, we don't. And 15% uh, said, don't know. So there we go. OK. And Rebecca reminded me of the all important follow up to that. Enough to do what we already have enough on one submarine to cause a global nu nuclear winter. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, interesting result there um and what's been happening in the chat can you bring us up to date yeah so um my colleague max has uh, sort of played devil's advocate he's asked an interesting question he says is there an argument that in some instances that nuclear weapons have enabled or prolonged conflict would putin have had the bravado to invade ukraine without kind of nuclear weapons i think it's interesting and i wonder if we can go to paul not who's uh, of the view that it would have happened anyway uh, he's also picked up on what rebecca was saying about the the lack of a difference or distinction between kind of strategic and tactical nuclear weapons so it'd be interesting to hear from paul if he's there paul are you around We, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Uh, how is that? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I missed also the, just the first part of the question. Was that about whether the invasion of Ukraine, Russia would have still made the invasion of Ukraine without... If... Yes, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I should say my sort of background. I, I served as a diplomat in both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, previously, um, no longer a diplomat now, but uh, I think Putin would have still made the same miscalculations. He'd, he'd, he'd still have been in the same sort of position of a an out of touch dictator that's that's you know got got the same ideas into his head that he's got now. Um, I think what would have been very different, perhaps um, having seen him make those mis miscalculations and commit all the atrocities, he's his forces have committed in Ukraine, the response would have been, you know, even stronger and fuller or a stronger and fuller response from the, the much of the rest of the world that we, we see would have been much more possible, um, much, much less restrained, much less subject to all kinds of walking a tightrope type calculations that we see now of, um, of not, um, of not wanting to get in a, direct conflict ourselves with Russia if, if Russia didn't have nuclear weapons, but you know, it does and there we are, and so do we. So you're saying that to, to a large extent, the fact that it's a nuclear power arrayed against others through the medium of um, Ukraine has defined the parameters of the conflict? It, it certainly affected them, I think, yeah, it it's impacts strongly the decisions that NATO countries can can take or the calculations we have to make with with getting more closely and directly involved, which makes it much harder to, to push Russia out of Ukraine. But then again, conversely, I agree, I agree with Andrew with, um, that it has the fact that we have nuclear weapons has 
deterred Putin from going much further and does continue to deter him from attacking NATO countries. Do I kind of have a question arising from that, if I may? Uh, yes. Can, can you hold the thought very briefly? Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to go back. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time. I would love to um, ask you about your experience as a diplomat in Ukraine and Russia, but you have to come back to a separate thinking on that. Um, yeah. James, are you raising your hand? Um, thanks very much, Oscar. I, I guess that the, the, the flip of the question, which is more nukes for what, is what happens if Vladimir Putin uses a tactical nuclear weapon? How does the world or the West respond? Because in that response, you would understand the arguments for or against more nuclear weapons. Right. Because if the case is, just to follow the thought through, if the case is that the West will not countenance the use of a nuclear weapon, then the logical consequence of that would be that you would want to invest at such a huge level the money that you currently spend on nuclear weapons, on conventional weapons, right, so that you do meet force with force, even if it's not nuclear force, and you're only using nuclear weapons for certain capabilities they have, as in in-air explosions, to, if you like, incapacitate existing systems. That's the problem. I don't know whether you saw Henry Kissinger made these comments over the weekend about the fact that no one internationally is debating what happens if Vladimir Putin uses nuclear weapons. That's what I think is at the heart of this conversation, is we're now at a moment which has not existed in my lifetime, where it's possible to think about a country using a nuclear weapon and us, therefore, having to think how you respond. Well, let's put that to Andy and Hassan and Rebecca. Andy first. What happens if, if Putin does use a nuclear weapon? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, I, th I think my, my pat answer would be that, as, as NATO said, it, it, it kind of would fundamentally, it would fundamentally change the nature of international relations across the world, um, which is a bit of a cop out, but I, I think until leaders are actually faced with that happening, nobody really knows what they're going to do. Uh, and, and I think we saw that with, with the pandemic and reactions. Some, some, some leaders really stepped up to the plate and, and dealt with it well, took on the, the, the challenges, and, and some didn't. And some states have thrived as a result, and some haven't. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, and this is, you know, I mean, I'm just speculating the same as you could. I wouldn't expect NATO to respond with a nuclear weapon. Uh, I would expect NATO perhaps to start getting engaged more assertively in, in the defense of Ukraine, certainly with regards to, uh, to piling in um, aid and, and, and assistance and, and conventional uh, defenses. But um, I, I think it, it's, Nuclear deterrence is, is the, the domain for brutal language. And frankly, being very brutal, Ukraine isn't important enough to NATO for NATO to risk a nuclear war over it. Thank you. Hassan. Yeah. Is that, is that the same easy question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I agree with, um, with Andy. Um, do you also agree with James that actually NATO wouldn't countenance the use of a nuclear weapon in response? I probably agree with that too, yes. Um, um, I, I think it's difficult to say and to predict, um, uh, but I think that would be one of the options that would be seriously considered because ultimately what everyone is scared of, by that point deterrence would have failed. We're talking about a case of failed deterrence. And again, feeding this into the earlier conversation, when we're thinking about whether deterrence works or not, logically, we only know whether it fails or not. If everything is, stays as it is, we don't know whether that's because deterrence is there or some other thing is, is functioning and working. But back to that question, whether it is wise, if something as consequential as big as a tactical nuclear weapon explodes in Ukraine, whether the response should be nuclear or not. That is a very, very tough decision. Partly because what you want to safeguard against is an escalation, 
ladder that ultimately would lead to an all-out nuclear war. What would be a proportionate response then is something that would be very, very difficult to come up with. But I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, war gaming um, uh, around it. But uh, something that I would just want to put between brackets is 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 the way to think about this is perhaps how to reduce nuclear risks more broadly. Um, so rather than thinking about how to respond, I think what we need, and this is you know a domain for slow thinking and a slow conversation, is to take a step back and think how did we get in a position where faced with such a scenario, one of the options would be loss of human civilization, which is one of the options. Um, it can be easy to say if this happens, we need to respond, and therefore we need all to build our arsenals. But I think that would be the wrong way to go about thinking about this. Uh, very briefly, before we come to Rebecca, um, given that we're in the situation that James described, where we are thinking in real terms about the real possibility of somebody using a nuclear weapon, um, how, do, how should that affect, um, bluntly, NATO weapons procurement? Should it, should it trigger a vast ramp up in conventional weapon spending, for example? Yeah. Um, I think it, would prob it probably will, and I think it probably has. I mean, we can see in Germany, for example, yeah. uh, a change of opinion and sort of a commitment to more defense spending. And I think one of the consequences of the war in Ukraine is, and it's not something that, I mean, Putin is certainly seeing the consequences of is that you get more countries joining NATO, like Sweden and Finland. I mean, to what extent this has backfired for him is, is to, what he, to what extent he thinks this has backfired uh, for him is, is, is yet to be seen. But it looks like you're going to get much more um, uh, solid and coherent NATO, more countries into it, more defense spending. Um, whether that is ultimately good or bad, I think it's very difficult to separate that from the original sin, which is the you know invasion of Ukraine. But again, I think what someone like me that wants to have a general reduction of nuclear risk would say is let's take a step back and think what systematically is wrong with this equation and try to address that rather than just you know react impulsively, uh, which is perhaps playing into Putin's book. Right. 20 minutes ago, Rebecca, you were talking about escalation, rapid escalation. Nobody knows whether it would happen or not. What do you think would happen if Putin used one? Well, let me dial back a, a, a moment to answer that question, because in 2016, at, I actually um, did, did a, a working paper for a UN conference which was on looking at kind of multilateral nuclear disarmament uh, on, on nuclear deterrence and really examined all the ways in which it was relied on and all the ways in which it could go wrong. And miscalculation was a massive part of that. But, but, but in this, I was doing this in 2016, and, you know, everybody at that time was talking about stability of leadership being a crucial part of the deterrence equation. Um, and, and we got then, within a year, we got Trump, who actually threatened to use nuclear weapons, let's not forget, in some of his, his bluster with North Korea before they then started to try and negotiate. And then we see Putin, who everybody at that, you know, in 2016, really was still singing Putin's praises as being a very stable leadership. Well, we now have to understand, we're talking about a world in which there's 13,000 nuclear weapons. 11,000 are actually engaged in the Russian-Ukraine war. But if you count up the, 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 the Russian and the, the, the uh, US, British, and French are, that are, are, are available to NATO, we're talking about around between 10 and 11,000 nuclear weapons are actually potentially engaged in that. And we're talking about one leader who tried it on convent with conventional invasion and within three or four days threatened and un unmistakably said, you know, we're going to put our nuclear weapons on special alert. That was a nuclear threat. And I actually hope and believe that he, that Putin also knows that that would never stop at one. Mm 
And that's the problem. He has to be deterred. Because what he did was a nuclear threat that was part of his game of deterrence. And indeed, in many ways, it has deterred NATO. But is that the world we want to live in, where we ha are constantly living under a sword of Damocles from any one of the nine nuclear armed leaders, when we know that just 40 on a, on a UK submarine can actually cause this nuclear winter effect of, of, of the dust clouds that, that cause the starvation. So what we have to, and, we, and this distinction between tactical and, and, and strategic, most military no longer make it. It was really much more associated with tactical, and was small. And, and particularly for the European theatre. Theatre was a bit broader for that. But we are, there is no real distinction, not in the size of weapons, not in the use of weapons. So if Putin does use a nuclear weapon and we don't respond with nuclear weapons, which I hope would be our answer, the line has nevertheless been crossed. And so we really have to think, well, what's the alternative to that? And that was the argument that was being had by uh, a, a lot of countries, including a number of members of NATO in 2016 in Geneva at the UN, for which my uh, paper on deterrence was, 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 was written, which was essentially saying, so what, what's the alternative? What are going to be the humanitarian consequences? What are the risks? What are the, nat uh, what are the dangers? What's the combination of risks, dangers, potential use, real use, and then impacts? And then two thirds of the UN basically said, we don't want to live under this sword of Damocles that only nine countries have, you know, the 13,000 that are threatening our survival. And a number of those countries have been launching wars from Iraq and Afghanistan to, you know, Ukraine and as well, launching wars against unarmed, non nuclear armed countries. Right. And, and they are not being deterred, in fact, for having a sort of sense of freedom of action to do that because of this thing called deterrence. So we've got to stop talking about the weapons of mass destruction as a deterrent and start thinking about in what ways do they deter, who are they deterring, and then what can go wrong. Because I look at what's happening in Ukraine and I can see that Putin is relying on his nuclear forces at the moment to deter pretty much the whole of NATO from engaging on helping to defend a sovereign country that has been brutally invaded and is having its cities pulverized. But Do we want to live in that world? I don't. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. We have to be more disciplined than usual about time. I'm going to come to you just for one more quick question, bringing it back to the UK. Uh, the uptick in principle in the size of, of the arsenal is the Johnson government undermining the new non-proliferation treaty in doing that? Um, uh, I mean, the UK has committed under the NPT to progressively move towards nuclear disarmament. It has not committed alone all the nuclear weapon states party to that treaty, which all the nuclear weapon states except for three have committed to do so. Does it undermine the UK? It does, but um, all the other nuclear weapon states are also modernizing, let's face it. Yeah. Um, UK's nuclear arsenal is, the, is one of the smallest, um, relying on only one platform, uh, is unique in so many different ways in its reliance on the US. Um, so it does undermine the NPT collectively, but perhaps less so than the massive modernization programs already underway in the other nuclear weapon states. Sadly. This is why non-nuclear countries banded together, I, they I are to... threatened as much as, you know, from all the impacts of any nuclear weapon, even one nuclear weapon being used. And they collectively got together and through the UN General Assembly, which involves and is open to every single member state of the UN, they negotiated in 2017 a new treaty called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And that allows that, that that actually mandates you know prohibitions on on all aspects that can lead any country or indeed a non-state actor to develop and use nuclear weapons right. and on top of that how to verify getting rid of all the existing arsenals now that I've got at to least give Andy... offers a way forward and it entered into force in 2021. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. I've got to give Andy one more uh, bite at the cherry, and I'm sorry we haven't 
gone to the chat more. John Hawksley is saying the key is how frightened will the leadership of a rogue, rogue state be of your nukes? Um, but I just want finally, and this will have to be the final word, uh, Andy, to come back to what you, Hassan, were saying about symbolism. As someone who's commanded one of these nuclear submarines, do you accept the argument that a, a big part of the current UK case for Trident renewal is symbolism rather than anything more concrete? And is it partly because of Britain's sense of itself? Um, no, is a short answer. Uh, they, they, we're not renewing Trident, we're renewing the submarines because they're getting old and tired and becoming less stealthy against the technologies that we envisage being uh, available over the next 40 years. So the, the bulk of the expenditure is actually on, on, on the things that are carrying Trident, not Trident itself. And if we're going to keep doing the, the strategy which we have, which is this assured response, those submarines need to be undetectable. And that's what where all this money is, is going right now. Um, and I think that my Parthian shock would be that the Article 6 of the NPT talks about each of the parties uh, undertaking to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of a nuclear arms race. It doesn't say anything there. Um, uh, uh, well, actually, to be fair, it then goes on uh, at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. But the important bit that keeps getting missed, I think, is and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament. And until we live in a world where states don't go to war, the best guarantor we've got to minimize the use of force of any type on, a, on the industrial scale that we saw in 1945 and that Ukraine is suffering right now is nuclear weapons. Uh, Andy, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to get everyone involved. Seldom has an hour long thinking flown by so fast in my experience. Um, I know that you have to go, so I'll keep it very short. I've learned a lot about um, the potential environmental impact of a nuclear holocaust, uh, about the, potent the possible reasons why the UK is considering expanding its, its nuclear arsenal, whether good for good or ill. And it's an interesting point, Rebecca, that you just made that 11 out of the 13,000 uh, nuclear weapons still in the world are actually in some way engaged in this war. Um, thank you everyone for getting involved, Hassan, Rebecca and Andy in particular, uh, and join us again for our next Thinking uh, tomorrow on, uh, on Boris Johnson's Conservative Party with Lara Spirit. Thanks again very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.